Wing Commander is a much more comprehensive universe than perhaps the mainstream public might think. The tie-in novels from the 90s have some excellent material that helped to bring the Wing Commander universe to life. My personal favorite, which will be covered here, is Fleet Action by William R. Forstgen, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, uh, which covers the events of the False Armistice up to the conclusion of the Battle of Earth. To summarize, the Terran Confederation, good guys, finally has the upper hand after a 30-year-long war with the Kilrathi Empire, bad space cats, when suddenly the Kilrathi sue for peace. But this ends up being a ploy to defeat the Confederation once and for all. So let's just get into it. In 2668, the Kilrathi War had been going on for close to 40 years. However, after a series of successful raids by the Terran Confederation exploiting defensive vulnerabilities in their shipyards and logistical transports, the Kilrathi Empire was in a bind. While the Kilrathi did still outnumber the Terrans in terms of ships and personnel, several major construction sites and capital ships under development were destroyed by Confed raids. Their projections indicated that there would be no replacements for current fleet ships, particularly carriers. As well, Imperial intelligence made matters worse by reporting that the Confederation would have four new fleet carriers that would allow them to reach parity with the active Kilrathi fleet. All of which was compounded by the fact that at least a quarter of the Kilrathi's active carriers needed to be overhauled, resupplied, and refitted. Which was made even more difficult as there was a critical shortage of military transports on the front line. Simply put, the Terrans were on the cusp of winning the war through production and logistics. However, all was not lost. The Emperor had an ace up his sleeve, Project Hari. Before Confed had begun taking the offensive, the Emperor ordered the development of a secret construction facility on the far side of the Empire away from the Terrans. This facility would be dedicated to the research and development of the new Hakaga-class heavy carrier, a ship that was theoretically invincible to any weapon in the Confederation arsenal, and carried with it a staggering amount of firepower and force projection through its complement of fighters and bombers. Along with these new carriers, Several escort craft were also under construction. However, this fleet would not be ready until well after the Terrans would launch major offensives against Kilrathi-held systems that could potentially end the war outright. But, Baron Jukaga, a Kilrathi lord that was formerly exiled due to his failure at the Battle of Vukar Tog, had a radical, completely unorthodox idea gained from his extensive knowledge of the Terrans. When this idea was brought before the Emperor and the clan leaders of Kilra, it was met with revulsion and disbelief. To the surprise of everyone in attendance of the meeting, the Emperor laughed and agreed to the Baron's plan. The Kilrathi Empire would sue for peace. Rear Admiral Sir Geoffrey Tolwyn was aboard his carrier, the TCS Concordia, when he received the orders to cease hostilities. However, he was currently leading an operation to liberate the Monroe system from the Kilrathi. Tolwyn chose to continue the attack knowing full well that the ceasefire was in effect and the consequences of ignoring such an order from Confed HQ. Eventually, the mission ended with the destruction of a Kilrathi carrier and an aborted attempt by Confed Marines to invade the planet Monroe. While the crew celebrated the end to almost 40 years of war, Tolwyn remained skeptical. He did not trust this offer of peace from the Kilrathi, but did not voice his suspicions to the crew. In his lifetime, the Admiral knew that the only peace the Kilrathi would truly honor would be through the utter subjugation of the Confederation, or their own destruction as a species. The entirety of Kilrathi culture and religion outright forbade anything else. So, the fact that this armistice came just as Confed had gained the upper hand for the first time in the war made Tolan all the more suspicious. An indeterminate amount of time later, Baron Jukaga had arrived on Earth to formalize the armistice. Tolwyn was also on Earth to give an impassioned speech against the Armistice in a meeting with civilian and military leaders, including President Rodham before it would be ratified. He cited that Confed's recent victories, tactical innovations, and technological prowess have just begun to push the Kilrathi fleet to the breaking point. As Terran intelligence had noted that Kilrathi ships were often being sent out to the front line with only 70% armament at best. Unfortunately for Tolwyn, Foreign Minister Rhonda Jameson, who is a staunch critic of the fleet, countered that 40 years of constant warfare, rationing, and economic strain had also pushed the people of the Confederation to the breaking point. So when the Kilrathi came with their offer, it was their belief that the Confed citizenry were the ones who lucked out in gaining a breather. Jameson was also quick to remind the Admiral that the fleet was under control of the Confederation government and would have to abide by their policies. 
This was when Rakik, flock leader of Fyarka, spoke out, stating that this armistice greatly angered her people, the Fyarkans. Her people had first joined the Confederation a decade ago only to immediately be invaded by the Kilrathi as Confederation space forces had to withdraw out of strategic necessity, abandoning their allies when they were needed the most. Rakik continued by flat out calling Baron Jukaga a liar and threatened to secede from the Terran Confederation if the armistice went through. As well, she stated that many colonial worlds on the frontier and the Republic of Landreich would outright refuse to abide by any treaty. But this was not enough to sway President Rodham or his staff, who had already come to their decision. Peace would be the future. In the hangar where the signing was held, Tolan was confronted by a Kilrathi named Tukarg. Tukarg was a member of Baron Jukaga's party, but more importantly, was third in command of the carrier that Tolwyn's forces had destroyed at Monroe when the ceasefire was in effect. Tukarg publicly accused Tolwyn of willfully ignoring the ceasefire in front of the Confederation press corps who were there to cover the signing. Obviously, this was a ploy by the Kilrathi to humiliate one of their most reviled enemies, but Tolwyn was backed into a corner and had no choice but to admit that Tukarg's accusations were true. Not long after, Jeffrey Tolwyn was tried in a military court of law by the Confederation Admiralty. He was found guilty for disobeying orders and was stripped of his rank and dishonorably discharged from the service. Baron Jukaga himself admitted that he almost felt sorry for the former admiral, as he had been defeated by a political ruse rather than an honorable combat. But he couldn't argue with the results, as Tolwyn was considered an almost unbeatable foe by some of the best officers in the Kilrathi fleet. Months later, in the Vacuum Breathers Bar on Luna, Ian St. John, callsign Hunter, Etienne Monclair, callsign Doomsday, and Jason Bondarevsky, callsign Bear, were commiserating over their inability to find steady employment in the new peacetime economy. One of the terms in the armistice was that the Terran Confederation would drastically scale down its fleet and armed forces. In one fell swoop, many pilots, officers, and other service people were no longer working for the Confederation. Sure. Confed did look after those who let go with unemployment benefits and free housing in the barracks and training centers, but many simply could not find work. Decades of being in a war economy that suddenly no longer had a war meant that there were far more people than there were jobs to go around. Fortunately for the trio, they were visited by Kevin Tolwyn, callsign Lone Wolf, with an offer from his uncle, former Admiral Jeffrey Tolwyn. Tolwyn sent his nephew to recruit skilled men and women they knew for a job he was planning, but gave Kevin no details as to what it might be. Hunter, Doomsday, and Bear required no convincing. If Tolwyn needed their help, he would have it. And besides, whatever he had planned would be far better than trying to eke out a living on Luna. Hunter, Bear, Doomsday, and Lone Wolf traveled together to Tolwyn's family estate in England to hear what he had to say. Much to their surprise, not only was Tolwyn there to greet them, but so was a collection of ex-confed service people ranging from technicians, pilots, crewmen, and even a commodore. When everyone was assembled, Tolwyn began to explain that five years ago, Confed Intelligence found the Kilrathi were constructing a secret facility to develop a new class of capital ship out in the Hari system. The only problem was that the Terrans could not get a ship to investigate these reports due to the complications of Kilrathi wartime security, and the extreme distance the Hari system was away from the Confederation worlds. Tolwyn then went on to explain that the most probable reason the Kilrathi called for an armistice was to cover for their recent production and transport shortages and to buy time to build a fleet out in the Hari system that would crush Earth and the Terran Confederation once and for all. While the civilian government did know of these reports when the Kilrathi proposed the armistice, they dismissed it as an unfounded rumor put forth by a military that refused to stop fighting. Unsurprisingly, it was Minister Jameson who made the strongest argument to President Rodham about going through with the treaty, even going so far as to call the Confed Chiefs of Staff liars. Everyone in the room was shocked at what they heard. All eyes were on Tolwyn now, as he began to explain what he planned to do.